Welcome here to Kronos Developer University at uh, Sugraf Asia. And I'm happy to start day two of the Kronos Developer University. Um, so we're going to go through uh, an overview of the Kronos APIs and the way that Kronos works to create open standards. And um, we're going to follow that with a overview of the new Kronos Kite program, which is outreach to educators around the world. And then we have a series of technical sessions um, for the remainder of the day. We have a session at 11.20 on OpenGL ES, um, Open SLES uh, at 12.10, OpenVG uh, in the afternoon, 2.15, OpenMaxAL, and then we'll finish up with a overview of WebGL, WebCL, and OpenCL. Um, and, um, Let's make this an interactive session. If you have any questions as we go through any of the presentations, please uh, feel free just to just ask. So the way we're going to structure this overview is to look at how the Kronos Group is reacting to industry trends. And we're finding first that the high-end API technology is still being created on desktop and workstation systems. Um, so we have desktop APIs like OpenGL for 3D and OpenCL for parallel computation. I'll give you a very uh, quick overview of those. Uh, but increasingly, in today's market, most innovation is happening in mobile uh, devices. And we not only need to provide acceleration for high performance in mobile, we need to provide that acceleration at low power consumption levels. And so we have a number of mobile APIs such as OpenGL ES and OpenSL uh, ES, and I'll give you an overview of those too. But as we uh, develop the mobile uh, industry and we begin to support more advanced applications like augmented reality, uh, the APIs no longer exist in isolation. The APIs have to work together and interoperate to enable advanced applications such as augmented reality and we'll talk a little bit about EGL and OpenMax that are enabling video and graphics and other APIs uh, to work very closely together. And then finally, uh, we're finding that as these mobile processors get into more and more devices, not just mobile phones, but cars, TVs, uh, consumer electronics, cameras, the uh, developers will need a cross-platform development environment and HTML5 in the web browser could be one of those cross-platform uh, development environments that will need acceleration. And so we'll talk lastly about WebGL and WebCL, which are bringing graphics and compute uh, into HTML5. So who is Kronos? Kronos is an open uh, standards consortium. Uh, we are open to any company uh, to join. We focus on creating royalty-free API standards for hardware acceleration of graphics, of compute, uh, audio, video, sensor hardware. The, we work just above the silicon. Uh, we try to be as close as possible to the silicon whilst providing portable access. And um, we are a safe place where many competitors come and cooperate to create the standards that we need to go off into the market and compete with great products. We have over 100 members in the Kronos group. We have many silicon vendors, uh, operating system vendors, middleware vendors, tools vendors, application vendors. Uh, so we get a good perspective from all uh, parts of the industry. Uh, we try hard to create API standards that meet real world needs and help advance the market. This is a, a chart of the most active um, Kronos working groups. We have one working group per API. And we can kind of group these APIs together. We have a family of 3D graphics APIs, uh, OpenGL on desktop, OpenGL ES on mobile devices, and WebGL in the browser. We have the compute APIs, OpenCL on the desktop, and WebCL uh, in the browser, but they're very closely related. And of course, WebGL and WebCL are also very closely related. We use them both in a browser, and I'll show you some examples of that in a second. We have EGL, 
which closely related to uh, the GL family for surface management, and that lets the different APIs interoperate together. This whole group creates a family of compute and graphics APIs that can work uh, together for advanced visual computing applications. So we kind of call that the visual computing ecosystem. We have Collada, which is a uh, the one standard we have that's not an API. It's a 3D file format. Uh, it's an XML schema for 3D asset interchange. OpenVG for 2D vector graphics. OpenSLES and OpenMax for audio and video processing. Screen Input, which is one of the newest uh, reference groups, so we don't have a logo uh, yet. It's for handling uh, advanced sensor input. And our newest reference group, which we announced yesterday, uh, so we don't even have a name for it yet, is a computer vision working group uh, designing a hardware acceleration layer for computer vision applications. And I'll give you more details on that in a second too. Taken all together, these APIs are a family of acceleration uh, uh, standards that can be used uh, by themselves or together to create great applications. So let's start with 3D, the 3D family. Um, we have a graph, so uh, we know uh, how fast 3D graphics has evolved over the last uh, 20 or 30 years. Uh, we've gone from um, Doom on the PC on the left hand side to real time advanced uh, graphics that are getting very close to being indistinguishable from reality. That's possible because both the GPU hardware is advancing and getting more and more powerful. But also we have the APIs to let developers access that GPU hardware. OpenGL is a standard that's coming up to its 20th birthday. Uh, it's been around a long time. It was the original 3D graphics API. Uh, and we're now in our fourth generation of OpenGL on the desktop. Each generation enables a new class of hardware. Uh, GL1 was for fixed function. GL2 was for programmable hardware at the vertex and fragment level. And then uh, OpenGL3 brings in geometry shading. And OpenGL4, full tessellation and compute. So the first two versions of GL were focused on making the surfaces look more realistic. Uh, GL3 and 4 have been focused on making the geometry uh, in the scene uh, more realistic and more, more complex. OpenGL is a very active area of innovation. We've had six uh, revisions of the specification since 2008. Um, so a lot of proactive development and evolution. Uh, OpenGL 4.2 is the latest version of the spec. And that enables access to the very latest in GPU hardware technology. And OpenGL 4.2 is um, really close, in, in some ways, ahead of DX11 um, in terms of uh, functionality. So we have OpenGL for uh, state-of-the-art graphics, but if we want to have things like physics engines, simulation, compute, we need OpenCL. That's the open standard for heterogeneous parallel programming. But again, we don't want these two to exist in isolation. We need an ecosystem, and we have been careful to make sure that OpenGL and OpenCL for graphics and compute uh, can inter interoperate very efficiently. We can send services and textures between the two APIs. We can also send events between the two APIs so we can interoperate in a very efficient way. So let's look at OpenCL. OpenCL comes from the realization that CPUs and GPUs are getting more and more similar. CPUs are getting more parallel. It's not quite common to have a two or four or even an eight core CPU. GPUs uh, have always been parallel. There are hundreds of processors in a typical GPU. But the GPUs are getting more programmable so that the two are kind of converging on parallel programmability. In the past, we've always had to use different programming techniques for CPUs 
and GPUs. CPUs, you would use something like Keythreads or OpenMP. GPUs, you would use a uh, shading language like GSL and OpenGL. OpenCL is the first framework that's been designed to let you write software that can run on CPUs or GPUs or any other compute resource that you have in your system. So the parts of the OpenCL standard uh, fall into three main parts. Yeah, we have a platform layer API, which lets you interrogate the system that you're running on, discover what compute resources you have, how many CPUs you have, how many GPUs you have, and to initialize those devices. The second part is a language specification called OpenCLC, it's very close to ISO C99. With that language, you write very small kernels, kernels of work that you want to be executed in parallel uh, across your compute resources. And then finally, a runtime API that lets you take those kernels, compile them, and send them out across the parallel compute resources and read back the results. OpenCL has an embedded profile built in, so we kind of learned um, from OpenGL, we have OpenGL and OpenGL ES. We've put the ES profile into the main specification itself, so we won't need OpenCL ES. It's already been designed and it's already in the one specification. So OpenCL 1.2 is the latest version of OpenCL. Uh, we announced uh, OpenCL 1.2 in Tokyo about a month ago. Uh, the specification is publicly available. Uh, it's a lot of uh, significant updates from 1.1 uh, in response to developer requests. But it is backwards compatible with 1.1, uh, and so any code you've written today will continue to run. We'll be going through in more detail this afternoon uh, on the differences between 1.1 and 1.2. There's a lot of active work on OpenCL right now, developing the specification in various ways. Now we've delivered 1.2, we're looking at the next step in the evolution of OpenCL, uh, making the memory model and the execution model more flexible, and we're looking to expose emerging hardware capabilities. But we're looking down in this in the stack, we're looking to define a cross-platform standard intermediate representation, and kind of like a binary code, if you like. So OpenCLC kernels can be distributed without needing to pass the source. And an intermediate representation makes it possible to create alternative front-end language compilers that target uh, the intermediate representation. So you'll get alternative languages than OpenCLC, which is great because many of those languages can be domain-specific and targeted a particular um, application area. And then we're also looking up uh, in the stack uh, creating uh, higher level programming language syntax for easily expressing parallelism and letting the system figure out how to use the parallelism to execute across the available compute resources. Uh, we call that OpenCL HLM for high level model. All these three, the main roadmap, the high level model, and the intermediate representation, which we call Sphere, uh, are happening in, in parallel. So there's a lot of uh, investment ongoing. So that's what's happening on the desktop, but we're looking now at the revolution occurring in the mobile space. Um, the PC uh, operating alone and then the internet, and now most people are doing much of their computing on mobile devices. We need to enable the advanced media processing on these devices. Things are happening very fast. If you plot how long uh, the PC took to get to 100 million units per year, uh, it was many years. Um, the smartphone uh, industry, accounting iOS and Android, did it in just three years. That's 20 years faster. So things are moving significantly faster than when we went through the same evolutionary loop with the PC. And if you look at that typical mobile processor, it's Moore's law that continues to drive this uh, revolution. Today's mobile processors are already very advanced. Multiple core CPUs, uh, advanced GPUs for 2D and 3D graphics, 
uh, high definition video encode and decode, uh, audio decode, image processors for handling multiple cameras, all packed onto a single die. And things have just started. This is a roadmap from uh, NVIDIA. Um, starting in Tablet 2, which is the device that's shipping in most mobile phones and tablets today. Looking forward, new generation of silicon every year until we can see in just uh, three or four years, we're projecting to have 50 to 100 times the performance of the mobile devices that we're currently shipping today. So it's going to be pretty amazing to see what kind of applications the developer community can create with that kind of compute power in the palm of your hand. But we need to have the right APIs to let the developer community actually access the potential uh, of those processors. That's why the mobile APIs are so exciting. So looking at the visual computing ecosystem, we have OpenCL and OpenGL. Now we have OpenGL ES, which is a subset of the desktop OpenGL to enable 3D graphics to ship on uh, mobile devices in a very cost-effective way. And OpenGL ES is already shipping on hundreds of millions of 3D capable mobile devices. We have interop with OpenCL because we have the embedded profile in the OpenCL specification. Uh, so we can make sure that OpenCL interrupts with either desktop OpenGL or mobile OpenGL, yes. So OpenG what is OpenGL ES? Well, it's a uh, subset of OpenGL 2.0. It's uh, a full programmable uh, API. Uh, and then although it's a subset of the desktop OpenGL, we streamlined the API largely by removing uh, redundancy. Um, in desktop OpenGL, there are many different ways of drawing the polygon. And we just chose the best way, the most modern way, and uh, we give that of OpenGL. It makes things a lot simpler, a lot more streamlined, uh, and it's cheap enough now to ship in many, many consumer devices. Um, but it still has the functionality we need to support state of the art engines, such as gaming engines, we have some here. Uh, UE3 from Epic, uh, the Unity gaming engine, uh, supporting very advanced content shipping today. There are two versions of OpenGL ES out there uh, in the market. And Tom, who's the OpenGL ES working group chair, will be in the session uh, later on this morning giving much more detail. But in overview, OpenGL ES1 was a fixed function pipeline, just like OpenGL 1.1. Uh, but OpenGL ES2 simplified the API even further by completely removing the fixed function pipeline for vertex processing and fragment processing and replacing those with programmable shaders um, in the pipeline, giving a lot of flexibility to the developer whilst keeping the API small and compact. So 3D graphics on mobile is cool, but as we said at the beginning, we're beginning to see the need now for using 3D graphics along with many other parts of these mobile systems. One use case, one application type that we'd like to use as a, an example and an inspiration to get all these parts to work together is augmented reality, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. It's the idea where you have a mobile device, you bring in the live video free feed from the camera, you do image tracking in real time to figure out where the device is in relation to the real world scene, and then use that positional information to augment the scene with 3D graphics. It can be uh, um, uh, imaginary graphics or informational uh, graphics that look like they're locked onto the video feed because you're sensing where the camera is pointing down to the pixel level. There's a lot of processing that's necessary to do augmented reality in a very compelling, high quality way. You need to bring in the camera stream, you need to figure where you are uh, by doing image processing, you need to render the 3D, and you need to composite it back together um, in uh, a pixel exact form. So if we were to do that processing, uh, what, are the, what are the processing blocks and steps that we need? Well, first, we need to bring in the camera, we need to control the camera and pre-process the video stream at, at a low level. We need to feed the video stream into a computer vision uh, module. 
we need to bring in the other sensors, the gyro, the accelerometer, the GPS, and we combine all those sensors together into a stream of data flowing towards the application that tells the application where it is and where it's pointing. We need to take that same video stream and send it to the GPU, because the GPU is going to combine the 3D and the video into one displayed output. We also need audio processing, uh, typically 3D spatial audio processing, which can greatly enhance uh, the augmented scene. So that's what we need to do. What are the APIs that we would need to do it? Um, can we do this in open standards? Well, we're getting close. Uh, we have OpenGLES for the 3D rendering and composition. Uh, we have OpenSLES uh, for the audio processing. OpenMax AL is a standard that provides both camera control and low-level video processing, and the necessary flexibility to route the video to various components in, um, in the system. We have the EGL standard that lets us connect the graphics and the video subsystems very efficiently. We have standards like OpenCV and OpenCL uh, for the computer vision processing and lastly the stream input for sensor fusion, bringing together lots of these sensor inputs to create a semantic sensor stream for the application to bring everything together. So we've only been able to draw that diagram with an open standard on each of those blocks for the last few months. And some of those APIs are still in construction. So let's look at these APIs and see where we are on making the system come to life. Firstly, OpenSL ES. Uh, Eric is the chair of uh, the working group and he'll be talking on OpenSL ES later today. Um, but I, this is my overview slide. Uh, OpenSL ES does for audio or sound what OpenGL ES does for graphics including having full 3D positional uh, audio uh, playback. It's an object-oriented native API, so it's simple to use, uh, but quite powerful in its advanced uh, audio functionality. Uh, be but because it's a high-level object-oriented API, you can easily write portable code that will run on different systems. It doesn't matter, for example, whether your audio engine is in software or hardware, <coughs> your application code uh, stays the same. We have OpenMax AL, uh, which handles cameras, image processing, and video processing. Uh, it's an object-oriented API, just like OpenSL ES. And OpenMax AL is designed for use by applications, and is designed to enable some key use cases that are of great interest around the industry. Advanced image capture and computational photography, High definition content playback with DRM protection, uh, high definition video teleconferencing using hardware. Uh, many of the video conferencing solutions out there on your phone today are actually doing all of the video processing on the CPU. We want to enable the GPU to be used, higher quality, better definition, and much lower power. Uh, OpenMax AL will enable that, and of course, uh, augmented reality. So OpenMax AL is an object-oriented API, just like OpenSL ES. In fact, it's the same object uh, framework that we use for both uh, APIs. It's quite simple. You have a media object where you do the processing that's required, and then you connect a number of inputs or sources, and you connect a number of outputs uh, or sinks. And each of the sources and sinks have controls. So if you have a camera as a, as a source, uh, you can control all aspects of how that camera is operating, the exposure, the zoom, uh, more advanced cameras will give you region of interest, uh, and more detailed control over the type of data that you're getting from the sensor. We have the flexibility to route the output to multiple sinks. So for example, we can send the output to OpenGL ES through EGL, or we can send it directly to the CPU. And, as I mentioned, OpenSL ES and OpenMax AL are two parts of the same object-oriented framework. So we have SL for audio, AL for multimedia. There is an overlap in the middle of uh, audio functionality, but it's the same API. Uh, 
uh, whichever direction you can come at it from. So how do we get video and graphics to interop? Traditionally, this has actually been quite a hard problem. Uh, a video system and a graphic system, uh, they're typically not designed to work together. Uh, you often have to read the video frame into the CPU, do a software conversion, and then load it back into the GPU. That's very slow and power inefficient. Uh, but now we have EGL, which is intended to enable a direct hardware, highly optimal link between the video and the graphics subsystems. And in fact, we just, uh, a few days ago, released a new extension to EGL, EGL Stream, which provides a high-level API for controlling the sequence of images flowing, for example, from the video subsystem into the graphics subsystem. And the way that works is you set up the uh, OpenMax AL as an EGL Stream producer, you set up a OpenGL ES external texture uh, as the consumer, and then the EGL Stream API gives you a pretty simple set of controls and modes how that um, sequence of images flows from one subsystem to the other. So for example, you can set up the stream to be in FIFO mode uh, if you just want to grab the latest available frame at any time, or you can have explicit Acquire and release of every frame if you want to have access to every frame uh, in your application. It will depend on the type of application that you're creating, you know, what is the right mode uh, that you'll need to use. The OpenGLES external texture includes the capability under the covers to convert the texture format. So if the texture coming in from the video is YUV data uh, into the format, the texture external extension to OpenGLES will convert that automatically into an RGB uh, OpenGLES compatible texture. So all of the details on how the conversions are happening, how the synchronization is happening, are hidden under the API. This enables the hardware vendors to create an extremely efficient uh, implementation, whilst making your code easy and portable. So stream input is uh, the last of the APIs that we had on the chart. Actually, not quite the last, we have a new one now, but almost the last API on our, on our diagram. Stream input is connecting uh, advanced sensors to applications. Uh, we have an increasing number of advanced sensors in these mobile devices. Touch screens, uh, GPS and inertial uh, and gyro sensors. Uh, we have cameras now being used as sensors uh, that connect on consoles. Uh, is one good example of camera being used for, for input uh, that's going to come to mobile devices using normal cameras and stereo cameras and perhaps soon we'll even have depth cameras in, in mobile devices using microphones um, uh, as input wireless devices. Applications want to get access to this wealth of sensors but they don't want to have to write code specifically for each input sensor and specifically for each system. That's going to drive everyone crazy because there are many different sensors on many different platforms. So we need a portable way of accessing this sensor data. Stream input has the concept of defining semantic information that the application can request from the sensors on the device. And then a graph will be created to process actual sensors on a device to provide that semantic information to the application uh, in a very portable way. So some examples of the semantics that you can request from a stream input. For augmented reality, you would say, where am I? Or where am I pointing? And then uh, stream input will simply give you that data. But you can create virtual sensors, for example, a sensor that will tell you, am I in an elevator? Or Am I being driven in a car? Or am I being carried in a hip pocket? Or am I being carried in a backpack? And sensor guys know how to provide that kind of information. And we can hide the details on how they do that underneath the API, giving you some magical access to the sensor network in a portable way. We shouldn't be forcing application vendors to access the individual sensors. Um, really, a typical application vendor 
should be getting much higher level data, accessing the, the gyro and the accelerometer and the compass individually is actually quite a bad way. You need to be quite sophisticated to know how to fuse all those sensor inputs together. We need the sensor guys to work at that level and provide the application developers with much simpler input. And lastly, stream input is addressing a significant issue that's been open until now, and that is how do you synchronize the various sensors in a system? If you're trying to create an augmented reality system and you have gyros and you have a camera and you're trying to use those two sensor streams in one application, if they're offset in time, you're never going to get a very high quality experience. So stream input provides timestamps for all of the sensor samples so the application can adjust accordingly and create a synchronized set of sensor inputs. We have a number of participants in the stream of a working group. These are the most active. Uh, there are companies like PrimeSense, who are the developer of the Connect hardware. Uh, they have a proprietary uh, API for controlling Connect. It's called OpenNI. Uh, they've contributed OpenNI to the stream of uh, initiative. So stream of will be a superset of functionality that you find today in the OpenNI uh, API. So the last um, uh, API that we had on our diagram uh, is for computer vision. This is a very new working group. We haven't come up with the final name even for the working group. This was announced yesterday here at the Sugraph Asia. So there are open source libraries like OpenCV that have been around for many years for advanced computer vision. Many applications and uh, research institutes use OpenCV and its advanced vision capability. But OpenCV is just a, sort, a body of open source, and typically it's running on the CPU. There is no API in OpenCV. There's no easy way for the vision functionality to be accelerated on GPU or DSP or multi-core uh, CPU hardware. So the OpenCV community approached Kronos and asked uh, whether we could define a computer vision hardware abstraction layer, a, a layer uh, of vision functionality that the silicon vendors can implement on their hardware in an efficient way, and then libraries like OpenCV or applications directly can come and use to create hardware accelerated vision applications. So we have initiated this working group. We'll be starting work in January. And if you are interested, um, you may be welcome to, to join and participate. We call it CV How Computer Vision Hardware Acceleration Layer. That's just a temporary name. That's not the final uh, name of the of the spec. So we have these different APIs on the diagram that are kind of related to sensor, compute, and uh, vision processing. Uh, the good news is that they kind of work together potentially in a pretty nice way. So at, at the bottom level, you have OpenCL. That's very low level, a very uh, intimate control over how you use your um, compute resources for any kind of parallel processing. You can use OpenCL if you wish. It's not mandated, but if you wish to, it would make perfect sense to use OpenCL to create a CV how uh, implementation that will be portable across different uh, processor types. Of course, you can use CV How as a very natural fit for implementing your computer vision library that takes advantage of the hardware, uh, be it OpenCV or some other library. And then you can use OpenCV to create your nodes in the stream input graph that are doing your computer vision processing to create camera-based uh, sensor semantic information. So it all kind of hangs together. It's almost like a design of that way. And of course, the APIs will all interrupt with OpenGL and OpenGLES for the display processing part of applications. So we'll be able to send images from computer vision libraries using CV How into OpenGL and OpenGLES. So having these uh, APIs uh, are good. Uh, but how are they going to get out into the industry? There's no point having the APIs if no one can actually use them on real devices. Uh, one 
useful operating system to encourage adoption is Android. Uh, it is an open OS. People can add APIs uh, to their NDK, the native development environment on Android. And of course, Android has an uh, uh, interestingly large uh, market share. So we're finding that Android is gradually adopting uh, these APIs. Uh, OpenGLES 2.0 has been shipping in Android systems since Android 2.2. Uh, OpenSLES has been shipping in Android uh, since Android 2.3. Uh, OpenMax AL was just incorporated into the latest Android 4.0, that's uh, ice cream sandwich. Uh, EGL has been under the covers in Android for actually many uh, versions, and Google are gradually uh, exposing EGL directly to the program. We don't yet have OpenCL stream input or computer vision in Android, but you know, we're working to make sure these APIs are useful uh, to Android uh, developers and we help and encourage Google to adopt these APIs over time. But of course there's a bunch of other OS services out there, and so we have this fragmentation issue. Many different types of devices, now having compute and vision and graphics capability, we need a cross-platform development environment. Many of the OS vendors actually don't like cross-platform development. They don't want their applications going off onto someone else's system. Uh, but we're fortunate in that we have now HTML5 in the browser, supported by many of the uh, platform vendors. So we have an opportunity to write portable software. But if that's going to come true, HTML5 needs to be much more than just a more page layout web pages. Uh, HTML5 is going to need to find access to all its, its advanced functionality that we've just been discussing. Multi-core CPUs, GPUs, parallel uh, processing, multiple HD cameras, HD encode, um, um, decode, uh, inertial and positional sensors. There's a lot of API work that needs to, to go on. How can the browser community, who don't necessarily have that expertise, get this functionality into the browser quickly? What we're finding and what we're working hard to enable is that the web community can leverage the native API work that we've uh, been doing at Kronos for over 10 years. We have the first proof point with WebGL. WebGL is a JavaScript binding into the OpenGL ES native API. And we'll give you a little more detail in just a second. But there are other potential connect points. We're already defining WebCL which is a JavaScript binding into OpenCL for parallel computation uh, in the web browser. We have the Web Audio Working Group at W3C is looking to accelerate their API with OpenMax. We have then other potential collaboration points. We need better camera control. Perhaps we can leverage OpenMax into JavaScript. Um, we need better sensor processing. Perhaps we can leverage uh, stream input into uh, the HTML5 stack. The W3C and Kronos are beginning to investigate how best we can work together to make these kind of cooperations uh, happen in practice. So, bringing the web into the ecosystem. For 3D graphics, we have WebGL, uh, a close member of the OpenGL family. We're finding that WebGL is already beginning to influence the other 3D APIs, for example, uh, the need for security is beginning to affect the design of OpenGL and OpenGLES. Uh, we're going into much more detail about that in this afternoon session on, on WebGL. But WebGL, at the, at the overview level, is, comes from the fact that we have this great opportunity to, to make the browser itself a 3D engine. Because we have pervasive OpenGL and OpenGLES from one side. From the, from the platform point of view, any platform that's capable of supporting the browser certainly has 3D capability, and that 3D capability will be exposed through OpenGL or OpenGLES. And from the browser side, we have faster and faster JavaScript performance, and it's getting faster every day. And we have the Canvas tag, which is a surface that we can write individual pixels to for the first time in the browser stack. So now we can create a JavaScript binding to OpenGLES, create a 3D context 
for the canvas, and suddenly the browser becomes um, 3D capable. The way that WebGL is implemented, we, we use the drivers in the system, OpenGL, OpenGL, yes. If we're on a platform that prefers DirectX, we have, um, Google has initiated a Angle project, which is a performance OpenGL ES 2.0 over DirectX 9. So even if your platform doesn't natively support high quality OpenGL, you can have a uh, high quality OpenGL ES 2. Then the browser vendor implements WebGL alongside the other blocks uh, in the HTML stack. The HTML layout engine, uh, the JavaScript engine, the CSS layout engine, and now we have WebGL. So the browser becomes a 3D engine, and then the content developers download content, JavaScript content, and can call WebGL in JavaScript directly or use middleware. And we'll go through some of the middleware packages out there this afternoon. Nice thing about WebGL, it's, it's not separate from the rest of the HTML stack. Uh, it's not 3D caught in a window. You can begin to mix and match 3D with the traditional HTML content. So the WebGL, for example, can use a canvas as a texture, can use a frame from the video tag as a texture, um, and the browser vendors are beginning to explore taking laid out pages and using those as textures. So, for example, you can begin to have web pages as 3D, uh, pages in a 3D book, and those pages are fully live web pages. So you can find a lot of in, uh, innovation in advanced user interfaces and applications uh, using WebGL over the next uh, few years. I have a couple of examples. So this is a, this is a web page uh, using WebGL. It looks like a, a static web page. It's running in, in the Chrome browser, but it's not a static web page. It's actually a fully functioning, uh, physically modeled uh, water pool. You can look at it from various angles. Um, you can play with the surface. You can turn off gravity so, so the ball begins to interact with, with the system. So here, WebGL has been used not just for the rendering, Jossie's written quite well, it's the GPU GPU has been used to compute uh, the, the um, fluid dynamics uh, in the system. Everything is running on the GPU. The JavaScript isn't doing that much. All the computation is, is running uh, on the GPU itself. Another interesting example of WebGL in practice is Google Maps. So this is a um, this is real Google Maps. This is not a prototype. This is the production Google Maps. I'm just going straight to the Google website right now. But you can now have the option of enabling WebGL in, in Google Maps. And if you have a site that is WebGL enabled, you can begin to go from 2D and the traditional uh, 2D. You go from the traditional 2D view uh, into a 3D view. And when you're in the 3D view, you can uh, begin to rotate and look at these uh, architectural buildings and objects in, in three dimensions. And you begin to uh, get, uh, you can go to street view uh, using WebGL. And uh, all this is uh, shipping uh, today. So if you have WebGL, oh, that guy's still working. Who was there yesterday? <laughs> He's doing a good job. Um, and you can turn this on in your browser right now today. So the last uh, API to discuss briefly is WebCL. So this is much newer than WebGL. This is still under construction, um, but I think it will be an important part of the HTML stack. We announced this working group back in March 2011. Uh, it's an exact peer to WebGL. Uh, just like WebGL is a JavaScript binding to OpenGL, yes. Uh, WebCL is a JavaScript binding into OpenCL. So you can do parallel computation from the browser. Um, typical use cases would include physics engines for games, uh, image and video editing using the GPU directly in the browser. And we're staying very close to the Open, OpenCL standard because it's a great foundation for high level uh, middleware. And let me find a video. 
This is a video of a um, prototype um, WebCL implementation. This is a prototype WebCL from Samsung in San Jose, California. This is running on a Mac. So this is this is a WebGL demo. This is two spheres running in the browser in uh, uh, a virtual environment. So a fairly standard WebGL um, application. But here we turn on a bunch of computation. Here the computation is being done in JavaScript. We're doing dynamic deformation of those two spheres to create uh, wob wobbling jelly uh, spheres instead. Because this, the computation is in JavaScript, it goes much slower because the JavaScript is the bottleneck. Uh, but we can offload that computation using WebCL onto the GPU, and the frame rate goes from one or two frames a second to over 100 frames per second. Uh, significantly higher uh, performance. So this is showing WebCL and WebGL working together to create uh, quite sophisticated 3D visual computing applications running uh, in your web browser in a portable way. This is the future. So we have then the visual computing ecosystem now including WebCL. Interoperating with WebGL derived from uh, OpenCL, um, a, a nice synergistic set of APIs have uh, been co-developed. So our dream would be to enable our augmented reality use case in the browser. Well, we're not there yet. Uh, it's not, we don't have all the pieces. We have WebGL for 3D. We have WebCL that you could use for image processing. We actually have EGL being used in many of the browsers. Um, but we don't yet have sufficiently complex uh, camera control. We don't yet have um, synchronized sensor fusion in the browser. Um, and we probably don't have enough composition flexibility in the browser stack as well. So this, this is the project for next year. I think you're going to find uh, that there's a lot of innovation in these APIs. So in summary, we're creating native APIs that are enabling access to advanced hardware. These APIs are originating on the desktop, but increasingly being deployed and adapted for mobile devices. These APIs no longer just existing alone, they're interoperating together to enable these advanced types of applications like augmented reality. And we're getting significantly more cooperation between the native API community and the web community uh, to bring these advanced capabilities to HDR5. And across we're focused on developing these open standards. We are an open organization. If your company uh, would like to participate in how these uh, standards uh, evolve, then you'd be most welcome uh, to join. You would be very welcome. Thank you very much.